Perfect. Oh, looks like even more people are coming right on the dot at 4.30. Yes. So he's, I guess we can start if most of the people are here. He's, yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm glad you were able to join us today. So my name is Kelsey Hancock. I am the client's rights advocate through the Office of Clients' Rights Advocacy with Disability Rights California. So he's, we wanted to bring this presentation to everyone today just to detail what is the Office of Clients' Rights Advocacy, what we call OCRA, and is how we work with Disability Rights California and what services we can provide individuals in the disabled community. So I will share my screen to get started. And if anyone has questions, please want me to elaborate on something, please feel free to speak up or raise your hand. I'm not sure how options we have, or you can put them in the chat and I can try and address those questions as we go. All right, perfect. So if everyone can see the screens here. Yes. yes. Perfect, so what is OCRA? I will, I wanted to first uh, present my contact information, but also the contact information for our local office. Again, my name is Kelsey Hancock. I've um, also started out with our direct phone number, my email address, but also the assistant clients rights advocate, Clara Torres. These, her phone number can be reached here. That's the main office line. So if you have questions or have individual case concerns, you can always reach out to us. And at the very end, I'll go back to this screen. So the people that haven't started now can go back and get it in writing. So I also wanted to do a very quick disclaimer that because uh, this is a group training, we ask that you not share any private or confidential information is I am an attorney and we do not have the right to confidentiality in a group setting such as this. So we ask that you not these discuss personal information about yourself or a family member, just so these, we can all have this privacy and confidentiality concerned. These, from our office, we are mandated reporters and we have an obligation to report abuse or neglect of disabled adults. This training is not a private consultation for legal advice and there's no attorney client relationship. We just have to give this disclaimer beforehand when it comes to group trainings. If you do have an individual or a private question, I'll go back to the first frame with my phone number and email address and please feel free to reach out to our office. So first, uh, I'm just gonna give a quick update about Disability Rights California. So Disability Rights California is an agency designated under federal law to protect and advocate for the rights of Californians with disabilities. I know it was mentioned that there may be some people here that are from out of state. A lot of, most of the time we have a disability rights California or disability rights for your own specific state. So you can always uh, look up that information and see if there is a disability rights organization close to where you are at or in your home state. These, they would also have more these pertinent information about your local laws and regulations. We work in litigation, legal representation, advocacy services, 
investigations, public policy. These we also provide information to referrals and community outreach, such as what I'm doing right now. We've been doing this for more than 40 years, and we've worked to advance the rights of Californians with disabilities. I work in areas of education, employment, independent rights, health and safety concerns. Pretty much we have grown into one of the largest disability rights organizations in the nation. So from disability rights, we're gonna do an introduction to OCRA. So the Office of Clients Rights Advocacy is a program from Disability Rights California. So these, we are just, there are many programs within Disability Rights California. We have the Legal Advocacy Unit, Investigations, these SSI programs. So for our program, we are specifically for regional center consumers. We're funded through a contract with the California Department of Developmental Services, DDS. So these, it's pretty helpful that these through DDS, so we're able to advocate for regional center consumers. So who do we serve? These, we advocate on behalf of consumers with developmental disabilities through the 21 different regional centers across the state. We include people who are currently receiving regional center services or people that are seeking eligibility to receive regional center services. These, if you have family members or friends or yourself that are looking to get regional center services and you've been denied or these, you just need help with the process, these, you can always contact our office and we can assist in areas of eligibility concerns. These, so with the client's rights advocate, the CRA, that's who I am. These, the client's rights advocate is the person that's trained to advocate on behalf of people with developmental disabilities. There's gonna be one CRA, for clients of every regional center, as well as statewide CRAs. These, we work in these so many different areas. So these with our office, for example, I am the client's rights advocate through for consumers of Alta Regional Center. And that's gonna be the Sacramento area, 10 different counties, I believe it's these, yeah, Sacramento, Placer, El Dorado, Yolo, these Alpine, Calusa, these so many, these, I always forget a couple. So these, a distinction that we do have is that I am an employee of Disability Rights California. I'm not an employee of the regional center in which the consumer is calling from. So people will sometimes uh, give us a call and have concerns that these they don't know if they can trust me to these talk about when they're having concerns with their local regional center. And you absolutely can. We have, the, again, the confidentiality where you can share information and I cannot share it with others. These, especially when it comes to regional center service coordinators or any other employee of the regional center. What I do is we provide free legal services for regional center consumers. And that means that you do not pay me. We're paid through the Department of the Developmental Services. And uh, these, what kind of services we can provide is free of charge for that regional center consumer. These, I try to resolve legal problems related to the consumer's disability. And these, I'll give a list of uh, legal problems that we typically come across where we can provide assistance. However, there's gonna be some areas where we just are not able to assist. And a lot of those areas that we get calls about is when it comes to landlord tenant issues, housing issues that are outside of the discrimination concerns. A lot of areas that we get calls about that we do not assist with as family law issues. I cannot represent somebody in a custody matter or in a divorce matter. It's 
He's, I get a lot of those calls and I promise you there's a reason I'm not in family law. It's a very draining area and I would prefer not to go back to it. And uh, I introduced uh, her before, Clara Torres. She is the assistant client's rights advocate with our office. Now we have an ACRA. He's, she's gonna be the person who manages the office. He takes care of the cases for myself. She answers the phone, returns calls, completes intakes. Likely when you have clients who are calling our office, she is gonna be the person that you speak with first. He's really helpful when it comes to getting all the information that I need in order to determine the best course that we can take in order to help somebody with their problem. He's, she can help clients directly and give trainings. And with an OCRA office, so we have one CRA and one ACRA. We also have statewide staff that can help when we have a significant amount of cases that are going through. Additionally, Clara is bilingual in English and Spanish. So if uh, anyone here speaks Spanish or they have a family member or a friend that speaks Spanish, we can assist. Additionally, in other languages, we have no problem. We have interpreters that we can use call and provide these for intake purposes and communication purposes. So I wouldn't want anyone to worry that just because you do not speak English or English is not your primary language, that it would be difficult or you have to provide your own interpreter. That is our job. We will provide that for you. So what can OCRA do for consumers of the regional center? He's really the big area is that we, we will provide information to them based on legal rights. I can review documents and advise somebody on how to resolve a case. A lot of areas that we will look into is uh, maybe special education concerns, maybe regional center concerns. Please, you have a, a concern with your child that's going through special education at the moment and you want help with having an IEP reviewed over. How do you read one of those? You can always give our office a call and I can review the document with you to make sure that you're really understanding it and see where it can be improved. Additionally, we can help prepare for upcoming meetings or hearings. That could be if you have a regional center concern and you are going to have a meeting with the regional center with your service coordinator or other staff. If uh, you're trying to figure out how to detail your concerns, how to really clarify with the regional center what it is you want. We can talk with you about it. We can really give you a little pep talk, provide these other contact information, provide regulations or other law that will help with your case. Or we can help when it comes to hearing if you have evidence that you just want somebody to look over and make sure you have everything. That's something I can assist with as well. And that kind of goes with assisting in preparing documents to assure compliance with the law. That could be that you're asking for evidence in a hearing. You want to make sure that you have it correctly. Who do you turn it into? This is information you can always contact our office and we can provide that for you. Please. Additionally, I provide legal trainings for consumers, family, service providers, or community groups such as yourself. So these. I'm doing this one for what is OCRA and then the one next week on specifically regional center services. It's, it's really helpful in this area that we want to provide the best information in order for you to advocate for yourself or advocate for a family member or a friend. Finally, we can represent at meetings or administrative hearings. Obviously, I cannot represent every single person that asks. It, I'm one person. We can review the case and determine if uh, we have the resources at the time to help uh, directly represent somebody either at a meeting or at an administrative hearing. If we determine that 
you do need the assistance, but I just don't have the resources. We can also what we call shop the case to many of the other clients rights advocates in the state of California, and maybe somebody else could assist you. And then finally, I investigate denials of rights. This is mostly for clients that are in developmental centers or in other these established homes that if somebody is, so if the home is saying that we're going to deny this certain right to a client, then I will go in and do an investigation and determine if that is appropriate. So in the areas of law that I can assist with, we're looking at areas such as the Regional Center or Lanterman Act services. We're looking at special education is a big one right now, especially post, I'm not gonna say post pandemic, but <laughs> I'm knocking on wood because I'm scaring myself that it's gonna come back. So in the area of post distance learning, there has been a lot of concerns. So many of the areas that we're going in is special education at the moment. These, we can help with social security concerns, Medi-Cal or private insurance areas. We look at areas of discrimination, and this could be that these you were refused uh, accommodations in a public building based on your disability, and that's something we can help you with in filing complaints. We look at alternatives to conservatorships. I do want to clarify with our office, we are very client-centered. And part of that is that we're not going to advocate for something that would remove the rights from somebody. And that's essentially what a conservatorship is. We understand there are, there are times when a conservatorship is needed for the health and safety of a person, but we are just not the attorneys that do that. What we can do is really talk with families about alternatives to conservatorships. And Many people don't realize that those are even options. They assume that because my family member is a regional center consumer, that once they turn 18, I have to have a conservatorship. And that's not true. There are many areas that one are way cheaper in option than going to court and filing for a conservatorship that will essentially assist the client in being able to make their own decisions, make their own rights, but with some help. That also goes along with personal autonomy. If we have a client that they want to live in a certain area, but other people are not agreeing with them, I can talk with them. I can have concerns about these, what is it that you want in your life and how can we help you reach those goals? These, that also goes with community integration that if somebody was previously in a developmental center, if they are leaving to be integrated back into the community, is what kind of supports and services we can help in is making sure that transition is as smooth as possible. We also, another big one is IHSS, that's in-home supportive services through the county. We get a lot of those cases and we can assist in getting either appeals or eligibility through IHSS. So I see that there was a question, can we help with social security cases? Yes, we, I think I have it a little bit further, but we can help if you've been terminated from social security or if you're fighting for eligibility, we can help in preparing a case with you or these just give you information about how to appeal or how to provide waivers if there's an overpayment concern, so many different areas of social security, but that is one of the big areas where we can assist. And then finally, abuse and neglect claims. That's normally where these, if they're in developmental centers or other homes, we can do those investigations. And Mina, did you have a question? So when you mentioned that you can take up cases with social security? Is it uh, also with uh, anything, anyone that appeal to ALJ, Administrative yes. of Legal Justice? 
Yes, any case Ooh. that is going forward with the administrative uh, law judge or going through an administrative hearing, we can mm -hmm. assist with if it directly correlates with somebody's disability. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. I will be contacting you for my own son. <laughs> Thank you. Of course, no problem. So please, I do wanna clarify again that we provide free legal services to regional center consumers. And these, I just wanted to give a little bit of a list of areas where we do help. And it can be representation at an SSI or an SSDI hearing. It can be assistance with SSI over payments. We get a lot of those concerns. These, it can be uh, age 18 redetermination concerns, work incentives while on SSI, information about how to apply. But also the big ones we get is how do you appeal a denial? So we can assist in these filling out the paperwork, filling out an appeal. These we do a lot of them, these helping with filling, with filling out these forms, especially if we have clients where English is not their first language and they are concerned that filling this out and filling out incorrectly could cause their case to completely stall or be kicked out. These we can help with either filling out or reviewing a form if you just want an extra set of eyes on it. We also have more legal concerns that we can assist with. It's information on applying for in-home supportive services. We get a lot of those cases, appealing IHSS denials, protective supervision. We also look at Medi-Cal. Um, we have many Medi-Cal cases where if you have concerns about eligibility, terminations, share of costs or waivers, we also are looking into having more information for clients about CalABLE accounts and how uh, these having these financial accounts will help with keeping your benefits such as Medi-Cal and Social Security so you're not going over the resource income limits. And uh, I mentioned a little bit about alternatives to conservatorships. We, these, those are usually power of attorneys or if uh, you have He's a child that just turned 18 years old and is still in school and special education. These what forms you can fill out so you can still be involved in the IEP process, even though your child has just become a legal adult. We also look at reasonable accommodations at work or in housing. We surprisingly had many of these come up during the pandemic when people were sent home because apparently people realize that small children who are not in school are noisemakers. Not sure if everyone here knew that because as a parent, but when your child is not in school, they are at home and they make a lot of noise. And many clients got noise complaints during those times from grumpy neighbors. Because apparently you can tell a four-year-old to be quiet, which in my experience is not an easy task. So these, we're able to have reasonable accommodation requests that these, hey, you're getting these noise complaints. Let's do this accommodation for a child that has sensitivity concerns, maybe move them to another apartment or have some other way you can accommodate in a work setting. So how would you get OCRA to help you with your problem? First, you would call our office. Use either call or send an email. We typically get referrals from both areas. You would call our office and uh, we'll talk with you about your concerns and also get basic information. We'll have it with, mostly it'll be with Clara, the Assistant Clients Rights Advocate, where she'll ask basic questions. So we just want to clarify with everyone what those questions are going to be. It's going to be your full name, phone number on how to reach a person, but also we look at addresses and birth dates, not because we're being nosy, but because we have many clients and we don't wanna mix up 
people that maybe have the same name. So we also look at birthdays to make sure that we are talking to the correct person we need to speak with. We'll talk with you about your problems, the concerns. There'll be plenty of follow-up questions just to make sure that we get all the basic information because at the end of the day, we're looking at how can I help you? If you're calling and saying that you have a social security concern, it's like, okay, well, what's the concern? Do you have documents from social security you can send to us so we can review them? If you have an overpayment, did you try an overpayment waiver yet? Have you appealed? When did you appeal? Please, a lot of those so that we can get a full picture of what your next steps need to be. So does every OCRA, these do we assist every regional center consumer who calls? And yeah, we, we typically try to help every single person who calls. However, that type of help is going to vary. We have uh, information from so many different people and we wanna make sure that we provide the correct and the best help for you. So it could be something as simple as, hey, I'm asking for this thing from the school district and they haven't responded. Is there a timeline in which they need to respond to me about this? And if there is a timeline, can you show me where that law is so I can tell them? It could be something as simple as that. And we can quickly do a response with an email that says, yeah, these, if you requested an assessment and you signed that plan, they have 60 days to get that done. Here's the law that says that, and here's how you can file a complaint on that. Something as simple as that, we wanna make sure we get the information to you as quickly as possible, because sometimes there are going to be timelines and statutes of limitations where you can't do that complaint anymore. We do technical assistance, and that could be something as simple as, you're not quite sure how to write this letter, you're not quite sure how to fill out this form, and you just really need our assistance in doing that. We can write a letter on your behalf and send it over. We can help when it comes to filling out documents needed, and that would be technical assistance, where we are doing a lot of the background work, but we're not directly representing you in a hearing or a meeting. And we can do an investigation of a case, and that would be for areas where there is allegations of abuse or neglect. We would make sure if they are in the home that they are safe in that home. If there are any other concerns, that's where we will look into it to see if there has been a denial of that person's right. And then finally, direct representation. That would be going, these, you are wanting to go to a hearing on IHSS where we would sign the agreement and I would attend and I would advocate for that consumer on their behalf. So how would I decide who I'm going to directly represent in their case. So it's going to mean I'm gonna completely take over the case. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to go to hearing and advocate for yourself. These they'll, a consumer will know they're directly represented because we're going to have a representation agreement. So a lot of times we'll have clients that will reach out or clients families that will reach out and say that they were actually working with another organization before, but they're not liking the way that person is helping with their case. First, I'm going to ask, well, did you sign an agreement with them? Because I can't take over if you still have a valid agreement with somebody else. Because a lot of those, we would fill out the form that is our contract saying that I agree to represent you at this hearing on so-and-so date. And these, you can guarantee that representation. Oh, please, sorry, I was looking at some of the questions here. Um, somebody was asking how long it takes to get the child into an IEP. Please, from the time that you request an IEP or an assessment to have an IEP, if the school agrees to do the assessment, they have 60 days to do it. So 
If you have questions where you're trying to get your child from a 504 plan up to an IEP and you just haven't received anything from the school, you haven't gotten a response, please feel free to reach out to our office and we can assist you in what your next step should be. And then next, what is IHSS protective supervision? So IHSS protective supervision is when it's determined that a consumer needs a more significant supervision than somebody else their same age. So it could be you have a 10 year old and you determine that based on that child's disability, they need more intensive supervision than an average 10 year old child. So you would get automatically if the child does not have severe these disabilities, they would get these 190 hours of IHSS for protective supervision, where either the parent or another service provider would be watching that child, what is essentially 24 hours a day type situation. These, we have a lot of publications on our website that detail protective supervision and how maybe your family member or these child, maybe they would be eligible for protective supervision. So these, I'm double checking, these We'll have our website up later on in use the PowerPoint. So you can always go to Disability Rights California website and we have many publications on IHSS, social security, special education, and you can always review those as well. So, oh, I'm starting off with self-determination program eligibility requirements for these, there would not be technically eligibility requirements. It would just be that that person is available to these startup with self-determination, that they would be available to make some choices, or they would have a family member who is able to assist them in planning self-determination and getting those services put in. I believe for our meeting, our training next week, I believe we're gonna have a little bit more about self-determination in there with regional center services. So I highly suggest you attend next week. If not, it'll likely be recorded like this one is, so you can always look into it. Additionally, if you just have self-determination questions, you can always reach out to our office and we can provide you with more information or publications on the topic. So back to here, in, decide, in deciding whether to represent a consumer directly, I'm going to look at a few things. These, I'll look at the merits of a case, the consumer's ability to advocate for themselves, or if they have family member or friend who can advocate for them, I'm gonna look at the availability of the resources. If I have multiple hearings that are coming up, I likely can't pick up another one. We'll also look at other advocacy sources that could be available to the consumer. If we're looking at SSI and we know that there are many attorneys out there that can represent somebody in getting SSI eligibility, then that'll likely make us not pick up the case because you have other options. However, there are a lot less attorneys who will work on SSI that has been terminated and you want it to be brought back. So that's maybe somewhere where we will do a little bit more assistance because there are not many other advocacy areas where you can reach out to. So finally, just based on that, I'll look at everything beyond the initial call. So if we're looking at a case and right after the initial call, we're unable to get a hold of the family member or the client again, they're impossible to get a hold of, we keep contacting, no one's responding, I'll likely not represent because there's nothing we can do if we just can't get a hold of the person. And I think, oh, okay. Just double checking if there are no more questions. So is every caller considered a client? And the answer is no. He's through our contract with DDS, 
we only serve consumers of the regional center. We're not advocating for their family members, not their service providers, and not their other advocates. If we're getting these, for example, we recently got a call from a parent that wants their child to remain in school these, and not go with the diploma track, but go on certificate track and stay in school until they're 22 years old. And uh, so we go, okay, is that the information you want on how to make that change? But because the client is over 18, we wanna speak with that person and get their consent, make sure what it is that they want. And with what they want, he's, the client clearly stated that he was done with school. He did not want to continue. He wanted to graduate with his friends and he did not want to be in the certificate track because the client was very clear, even with the mother there trying to guilt trip him, we had to tell her, we're not going to help in making this change. This is what he wants and we're going to respect that. So there are times when what a parent or somebody from the regional center or a service provider that they want this, but a client is saying, no, I don't wanna do that. Even if it's not in their best interest, we're still going to respect that decision because at the end of the day, with the individuals uh, who have disabilities, we, we respect their decision to make these decisions on their life, even if sometimes they're bad decisions because that's part of growing up, right? We can't all state that when we were 18, we made all the best choices. So same thing with any other person who is a regional center consumer. So at the end of the day, consumer is our client, not the parent, not the family member, not the service provider. So OCRA, we work to support the expressed or the best interest of the consumer. And this is where it can get a little tricky. So the expressed interest is when a client tells us what they want. For example, like in my previous story, we, we were able to speak with the client and the client clearly stated, I do not wanna stay in school. I wanna graduate with my friends and I do not wanna stay until I'm 22. I'm done with this. I wanna get out and I want to go get a job. So here is we go, okay, this is exactly your expressed interest. And this is what we're going to advocate for. And this is what we're going to assist you with. But sometimes we're gonna have clients where they cannot communicate their wishes or their desires. So when we have nonverbal clients, we will assist in getting what we call the best interest of the client and how that can be met. We'll look at how it is I'm going to determine somebody's best interest. These for example, we'll get he's a family member that says, hey, this person's SSI was terminated. We don't know why we're trying to appeal it. Even if that client is over 18 and I cannot speak with the client to get their consent to help assist with this appeal, it's, we're going to state, okay, it's in this client's best interest that we appeal this SSI decision and get them their SSI funding back. He's, sometimes we're going to have areas where he's really the area of best interest is going to be gray. And from that, we're going to look at family. We're going to look at their circle of support, care providers, maybe the service coordinator through the regional center, or any other person that's really important in that consumer's life to determine what is in their best interest. And when I'm talking with clients, we're also looking at confidentiality. Since the consumer is my client, only the client is entitled to receive information about their case. We can share information about their case if we get their permission. We've been typically doing it over the phone with verbal permission before we used to try and do it in writing, but frankly, Many of us are not in offices. Many of us don't have access to printers or 
any other device in order to sign things. So he's, we've been kind of going on the good system of, hey, person gave me verbal consent to speak with you. And frankly, we're going to have clients where writing or signing is just not an option. So he's, sometimes I will be able to he's add in Zoom and be able to speak with a client or communicate with them in a way. So if a client is nonverbal, but they're able to shake their head, I can look at body language. I can see that, hey, this person cannot say yes or no. But when I ask something, they shake their head yes. Sometimes they will have a communication device where they can say yes or no with an iPad or their cell phone. Or we'll look at body language. These, I'll see this person and they look extremely comfortable next to their parent. They are smiling, they're happy, their body is facing to them. And I will see that this is an area where these, I will look and that's consent. These, and this mostly comes up when it comes to regional center service coordinators. You're reaching out to me and saying that, you know, I don't really like my service coordinator. They never respond to me. They are always like, oh, let me, let me find out about that and I'll get back to you. And they never do. Please feel free to use me as your semi-therapy session and know that I cannot turn around and tell that service coordinator, hey, you're doing a bad job. This person does not like you. He's, what is going on? I will not and cannot do that without your consent. Sometimes you're able to say, hey, can you help me facilitate a communication so that we can get this issue resolved? Great, I can absolutely do that. I can contact them and say, hey, this person's trying to get a hold of you. Is there something going on? Can we, uh, can we schedule a meeting with the three of us? those kind of areas where our office can help with getting communication back on track. So this also means that we cannot share information with family members. Sometimes we'll get those where the client is saying, hey, mom's a little overbearing. I don't want you to share information with her. And she's calling me, screaming at me, saying, that's my baby. I should know everything about that baby. <laughs> Sometimes the uh, Again, the client is, is, the consumer is my client and I cannot share information with anybody without that person's permission. This also goes with conflicts of interest. We talked about a little before when the expressed or the best interest of a client will contradict with other people. So what the family members think is the best interest or what is what, Alter regional thinks is the best interest of that person. If they're saying, hey, we want you to go stay in this home, but the person's going, no, I, I don't want to stay there. I want to live somewhere else. See, even uh, when it comes to conflicts of interest, I'm going with what my client says. Even if I think it's a good home that the person will probably enjoy, it's their decision to make. So what if you have a problem that OCRA cannot assist with? I'm looking at you, family law people. Nah, please don't like family law. You make a lot of money, but it's not worth the mental health. So if the consumer has a legal problem that we cannot assist with, we're looking at eviction issues. We're looking at landlord tenant issues, housing concerns. We're looking at family law concerns or other area where you think there's been discrimination, but it's not against somebody's disability, then what we can do is I can refer to other advocacy organizations that may be able to help. We can send self-help publications, as I've stated before. We have many of those you can look into. We can also, if the person is not a regional center consumer, and they contact our office by mistake, we can easily send them over to disability rights and get them to the correct program who can be able to assist them. 
We can also look at family resource centers through either the regional center or through these, the local court system, these many of those areas we can try to assist with. So we also wanna give, how do you contact your local OCRA office? These, if you know the person's name, you can contact the office directly. If you're not quite sure who your local staff is for the local OCRA office, and this is gonna be for the people on here who were either out of state or out of the Sacramento area, and you're, you know that you have a family member or friend who is not a Alta Regional Center consumer, then you can always call the phone numbers or you can look at our online staff directory at disabilityrightsca.org. You're gonna have the listing of all the local regional centers and who the client's rights advocate is for that regional center and also their office phone number. So you can contact them through there. So yeah, I, this is it. We just have a complete survey that we'll be sending out, but also any questions that clients have. I'm seeing a couple of people in the chat. Let me pull up our, these, our contact information here so that you can get that information down if you didn't in the beginning for people that joined after the fact. So I'm looking at some of these questions. Okay, so I'm seeing some areas that asking about social security, Hmm. I have not had the information about a deceased parent's financial information, but uh, he's, what you can do is if you're having a specific SSI concern about your own child, you can always reach out to our office. We can look at forms that, re that SSI has sent you and review whether or not the regulations they sent are correct. Um, how would you designate another rep payee in case where a designated representative payee passes away or becomes incompetent? These, we have uh, forms that should be online and also the regional center should have forms on how to designate a new representative payee. So if you're ever having concerns, the regional center should have that information as well on the specific forms you should fill out. So we have one question also from Mina about if a consumer is conserved, then can the conservators talk on their behalf? So he's essentially, we try to still get consent from the client and I'll do the same information if it is, if the person cannot speak, they're nonverbal, we can at least provide that information. We're still client centered, even with a conservator. However, if we determine that we really cannot get informed consent from a person and we're looking at a best interest issue, then we could, we would ask for the conservatorship paperwork, make sure that person has the right to make those decisions. And we could work with a conservator to provide the best information for a client. Okay, thank you. And he's, yes, I can share the PowerPoint. And, and, uh, and I, we will be having this recording uh, in our YouTube channel, We Embrace. If you can subscribe to it, you will get the notification when we, when we share the recording. Yes. And I'm seeing some regional center concern questions. Hopefully we'll be able to review some of that next week. So, I see here, what can you do about social recreation services for your daughter? That social recreation services should be in effect now. So if you are having a regional center who is saying that they are not in effect, is 
I'm not sure they weren't a few months ago, but they should be in effect now. The San Andreas Regional Center is, I am off the top of my head, not sure who the service coordinator would be for that, or the he's CRA. But if you go on our website, is you'll have a list of the regional centers available and the correct client's rights advocate for that regional center. So you can always contact them and they can contact San Andreas Regional Center to determine why social recreational services are not available yet. So, oh, are you talking, and I think Amanda, you're talking about the form for rep payee. These, I believe that we would have it in one of our, these, I'm going to need a, I would need to double check here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen since it's taken away all of my ability to look at things. Um, is, Do we but, have a question? Uh, see Mina here, I have a question. Uh, I, I don't know if you can cover this today or if it will be covered next week. So as per DDS, DDS has come out with a directive saying the rates have been changed for the vendors. Like the, I mean, and but then when we ask the uh, regional center care coordinators or even the directors, they say that at their end, they did not get any kind of notification from the DDS. You know, this is very important because one is self-determination, the vendor rates, the vendors have increased the rates, whereas the budget hasn't been increased for a consumer. So for example, uh, like BIS, Behavioral Intervention Services, excuse me, my son is very loud, uh, just a second. Sorry about that. I have guests also at home. No, there's no my problem. Question, my question is: so, for example, uh, the day program, the budget would be decided by during the IPP, and mm -hmm. whereas when it comes to SDP, the same day program charges differently for the for the consumer and the for the consumer because their rates have increased due to information. Okay, and you're wondering about uh, these DDS rates and how that would go with the regional center. Just a second. No, I didn't complete my question. Sorry. It's okay. Sorry, so I'm, sorry I'm not organizing this one. So my question is, uh, uh, you know, what is the procedure? Uh, like, uh, I mean, I don't want to anyone to contact OCRA for these kind of things, you mm -hmm. know, because this is a generic one and uh, everybody's interest is involved in this. So, the regional center knows that DDS has issued the dis directive, whereas uh, they are not acting on it. So who is the who is the person who needs to ensure that the regional center is following all of this? So uh, is we'll go over a little bit of that next week, but I can't quickly say that uh, is if uh, there's concerns that the regional center is not following DDS guidelines, and is you can file is anyone has the right to file a forty seven thirty one complaint. And we 